if I can start with you, uh, Minister Roger Nogoro. In light of you know, the, the mood in Davos seems to be a lot of doom and gloom. And especially when it comes to emerging markets, a lot of headwinds, it seems like it. Uh, what is your outlook on Indonesia uh, and, and, uh, and, and the emerging market world today? Okay. John, I think you are right to mention that this is not a time for the emerging market, unfortunately. Uh, I believe we have followed what happened in the global, starting what happened with the US in 2008-2009, uh, followed by the Europe. And unfortunately, after the US, Europe actually is a turn of the emerging economy. And of course, uh, we are in the very challenging situation. And at the same time, 2016, at least there are two issues uh, facing us. First is the slowdown in China although they recorded 6.9%, uh, but still relatively you know, slowed down compared to, the, to their uh, high economic growth. And then, of course, secondly, is the low oil price. Low oil price is not about the oil itself, but mostly about the commodity price. It means that we don't have basically uh, too much ammunition. So what we have to do uh, as an economy, first, we need to establish our domestic economy by still keep spending on the government side, uh, especially for infrastructure, in not only just to build the infrastructure, but more importantly to boost the economy itself. And then secondly, of course, attracting the investment. And I think the forum like this is very important because basically Indonesia still needs foreign direct investment. And from our side, we are still welcoming very much the importance of the FDI. Yeah. So what, what is your outlook for Indonesia's growth this year? Okay, I still uh, stick to the, to the outlook in our uh, budget 2016, which is uh, economic growth of 5.3%. And I think uh, the figure is still doable, given the fact that uh, according to many analysts, although the, as I mentioned, it's not the time for the emerging economy, but they still consider Indonesia is one of very few bright spots in the emerging economy. Wonderful. Maybe I can turn to you, Minister Lembong. Um, what are your priorities? So you're one of the newest ministers in our cabinet. Um, what are your priorities uh, as you take office? <clears throat> Thank you very much, John. Um, I think I want to start by reiterating a point which President Jokowi made in his speech at the Brookings Institution a couple of months ago in Washington. <clears throat> and that is that uh, any situation can be a problem or an opportunity, depending on what you make of it, right? <clears throat> True, we are now in the middle of an emerging markets downturn, but as the president has said, it's actually a great opportunity to push through painful and in many cases overdue reforms, right? Uh, and Minister Bujanagoro can confirm in cabinet meetings, right, <clears throat> the president's underline, uh, forget about pushing these reforms when times are good. It's just not going to happen. Uh, but when times are difficult, when anxiety is high, uh, when people are more open to new things, like now, this is the time for reform. What, what would be some of those reforms? So I think uh, it's probably on the trade side, reasonably well covered in the media, but we're trying to execute what could be one of the sharpest policy U-turns in recent Indonesian history, which is a country, Indonesia, which for the last 10 years, and certainly, especially since the 2008 financial crisis, has probably resorted the most heavily to protectionist measures. It's now wanting to go precisely the opposite direction. Right? We're now trying to actually dismantle protectionism, uh, smoothen our integration into regional and global supply chains. Uh, it's uh, Fair, you know, frankly, a fairly radical change of paradigm, I would say. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's, it's part of what, uh, what President Jokowi called the mindset revolution, right? And that's conceptual, it's ideological, it's also mechanical, you know? Uh, regulations in the field. Um, our civil servants, you know, my colleagues in trade ministry, our colleagues all around uh, the different ministries. There's been a lot of talk about, talks about re the revision uh, of the negative list for foreign direct investment, uh, what are some of the are you, you know, what are some of the industries that are being discussed uh, and could possibly be opened? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, BKPM Chairman Sibarani has already made some comments uh, with respect to, for example, the hotel industry, 
um, you know, movie theaters and movie production, movie distribution. <clears throat> but uh, frankly, uh, what we agreed to in the cabinet was to give it a bit more time um, and to go for something a little bit more ambitious. Um, I think uh, Minister Bojanagora and I don't want to preempt uh, our uh, coordinating minister, uh, but the timetable is, I think, about two to three weeks until we see the, the bigger announcement. And last question for you before I move on. In your previous life, you were a fund manager. You're running one of the largest private equities in Indonesia. What, how do you view the Indonesian economy today from, from that perspective? Well, <clears throat> as an investor, uh, in hindsight, um, the boom times were actually a terrible time to invest, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which uh, we, we put capital to work, um, you know, because that's, it's, that's when it's easy to invest, right? Things are booming, uh, you know, you, you put forward very rosy financial projections. Uh, that turned out to be not the case, that turned out not to be the best time to invest. Actually, I think with the benefit of hindsight, I would say now is the best time to invest. You know, the currency is off 30, 35 percent. You know, personally, uh, by measures of trade competitiveness, I think it's, it's very competitive, you know, at this point. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, using my glasses as a, uh, as a lifelong uh, finance and investing person, I would actually say, you know, we're probably nearing some kind of a bottom. And probably now is, is a better time to invest uh, in Indonesia and emerging markets, especially if you're a long-term investor. Great, great. Babudi, uh, you, run one of, you run Indonesia's largest bank. Uh, what is your outlook of the economy? Uh, and what do you see the role of banking uh, in, in, in uh, Indonesia's growth? Indonesia is very unlucky because we have a lot of volatility in the last 15 years. It happens in 1998, 2005, 2008. But also Indonesia is very lucky because during those crises, we still have finance minister like Pak Bambang, you know, conglomerate like you, and bankers like me, that still doing the same job, still live, and we survive. So actually, we, are, we have a lot of experience in, in facing the crisis. And to prove that we are survived, actually we can handle the crisis as well. I still remember when, Back in 1998, the senior banker told me, Buddy, you have nothing left on your right side of your balance sheet, and you have nothing right on your left side of your balance sheet. <laughs> but also, my experience tells me in the last 25 years as banker that during, bad, uh, during good times, Indonesian people make bad policy. But during bad times, Indonesian people make a good policy. So, so I strongly believe, and I've seen what Pak Bambang is doing, Pak Darmi is doing, Pak Tom Lemo is doing. We, we are making a lot of good policy. Uh, to be honest, Last year and this year is not, is not a star year for Indonesia, but I still see opportunity ahead. You know, I have many uh, Chinese customers that teach me something, and I've seen it in practice back in 1998. Crisis in Chinese is, they call it Wei, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, Wei Qi. Yeah. It's two characters. One character, Wei, can be uh, paired with another character called Wei Xian, which is danger. But Qi also can be paired with other character called Qi Hui, which is opportunity. So, crisis happen in Indonesia, it, it imposes danger, but it's also open opportunity for you that is sharp enough to see the opportunity. Excellent. Despite the strong headwinds that Indonesia is facing, many people claim that Indonesia today is much stronger than it was, let's say, in, in 1998. And one of the reasons cited is the health of the banking sector today. Uh, would you agree with that? Uh, Sorry to be a little bit technical. Uh, banks is being measured by the capital. So back in, in 2008, the average capital, capital adequacy ratio, that is, that is the ratio is used by bank, uh, banks all over the world, is below 15%. Now the average is 17, 18%. So we are much stronger. I still remember back in 2008, the non-performing loan for the banking system reached 5%. Now it's only like 2.5, below 3%. Liquidity position in 2008, you feel that US dollar liquidity is almost none. Now, US dollar liquidity is very, very ample. Rupiah liquidity, because of Pak Bambang, you know, withdrawing all the money at the end of the year is, is a little bit tight, but now it, it's okay. <laughs> it's back to normal because Pak Bambang also spent the money very, very fast this year. Uh, thank you to Pak Bambang. So, I think, yes, we are, we are, we are facing headwinds. But again, I remember, John, you, you, you told me about this. When the wind of change is coming, 
many people will build walls, but only smart and few people will build the windmills. So I think we should build the windmills. Great. Mm. If I can turn to you, Panin. Uh, Panin, in your capacity as vice chairman uh, of the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce of Kadin, uh, what's your, how do you see the economy from the private sector's perspective? <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you, John, for having me here. Um, first, let's take a look at the fundamentals, right? Um, let's check whether the factors that help us to get here are still sustainable going forward, right? Especially in the last 20 years. Um, the first one, social political reform. I think since 97, we had that, and nobody wants to go back to authoritarian rule. I think it is here to stay. Um, stuff like uh, the election of President Jokowi, uh, Governor Ahok wouldn't be thinkable in the past. Now it is possible and nobody wants to go back. And that will bring sustainability uh, in the economy going forward. The second thing, I think uh, domestic consumption is here to stay, uh, if not growing. 65% uh, of the GDP already. Yes, one would argue that it is because little windfall profit from the commodity boom, but I would argue later on that the um, infrastructure development and regional growth, uh, as well as uh, digital innovation, will uh, take over uh, that uh, past boom. So I think we will continue to grow domestic consumption. And if we can grow from being the 16th largest economy in the world to something else, uh, I think uh, you know, it's something good. right? Because at the end of the day, we talk about a trillion economy, big economy, and all that. But this is uh, $4,000 uh, per GDP per capita. Right? So that's still pretty low. And the last thing, um, the uh, demographic growth. Um, I think it's not going to change. People will still make babies. Uh, and I think more so when they're happier. Um, and, and having 45% of the uh, population of ASEAN uh, in the uh, era of um, ASEAN community uh, coming up, I think that's only a good thing. If there is one thing which is a challenge uh, for all of us, uh, uh, not only the government, parliament, but also the um, private sector, is whether uh, we can continue to grow, again, uh, the economy, domestic <coughs> consumption, what have you, despite the fact that you know, the oil price is below $30, you know, China is uh, having a little bit of uh, challenges, you know, the Fed being you know, reducing rate and all that, and also the radicalism that you know, we can talk about it later. Uh, but I think you know, as uh, we can talk about it you know, uh, as uh, we, we talk uh, later, um, I think we're resilient enough. Uh, we have been here before. I think this is not a time to be uh, complacent by any mean. Uh, but I think uh, if uh, we are uh, focused on what we should do and why we do uh, best, what we do best, uh, I think we can overcome the current challenges. Uh, on the issue, you know, you mentioned ASEAN. Uh, on the issue of ASEAN, are Indonesian businesses ready for that opening up? Well, it is one of those things, right? You will never be ready until you get there. You know, I think Mike Tyson says that, right? Until you get hit in the face, you don't know how to box, right? So it's one of those things that I think uh, Indonesians are ready because by nature, uh, if you are uh, sizable, scalable in Indonesia, you are scalable in ASEAN. Uh, but having said that, uh, not to be complacent in any mean, we need to produce a lot more things, you know, ranging from infrastructure uh, development that we need to, to build, but also just human resource. You know, we, for example, I think produce like 50,000 engineers. I'm an engineer myself uh, a year compared to China about 750,000, and then maybe uh, India about 300,000 is not enough. So all those things, as the uh, GDP per capita improve, uh, people will need to be more educated, and uh, health will be needed, which is you know, a business in and of itself. And at the same time, they need also entertainment, which we also can you know, do well in that business. Yeah. Professor, if I can turn to you with a few questions. Uh, as the uh, non-Indonesian on this panel, can you provide, you know, what is the perspective on what's happening in Indonesia? Do you agree with what's been said, or are we delusional uh, being from Indonesia? Now, do you want me to be diplomatic or not? <laughs> You're always diplomatic. I was a diplomat for 33 years. <laughs> no, no, okay, okay let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me speak uh, frankly. I mean, I think we, you're right. There's doom and gloom in Davos. Uh, I think it's, excess, it's excessive. I think it doesn't get the big picture right. But leaving aside what's happening in Europe or whether or not Donald Trump will be elected president of America, leaving all that aside, <laughs> if you look at our region, it's clear we are sailing through troubled waters now. 
That's obvious, right? The figures all say so. The question is, as you sail through these troubled waters, are you going to enter rougher waters or calmer waters around the corner? And it's very clear, if you look objectively at the larger picture of Southeast Asia, East Asia, South Asia, if you look at the big picture, around the corner, uh, many good things are awaiting us. I mean, the Economist cover story got China completely wrong. You know, they showed this week President Xi Jinping riding a dragon that is going down. Excuse me, that dragon is going up. Ten years from now, China will be much bigger, much stronger, more capable. The Chinese middle class is exploding. Already 100, China, 100 million Chinese travel overseas as tourists, and many will come uh, to Southeast Asia. Just one example. Uh, India is going to become the fastest growing economy, 7.3%. And as you know, traditionally, if you look back over the past 2,000 years, Southeast Asia has always been affected by what happens in China, what happens in India, and if these two countries basically get it right, we get the, the benefits too. But the, the, the real good news about Southeast Asia, and this is the, what you call the uh, big elephant in the room that no one has noticed, is that the reason why we are relatively calm about Southeast Asia is because we have created something called ASEAN. It's the most boring organization in the world. <laughs> but, you know, in a world of troubles, boredom is wonderful, you know. And I can tell you that ASEAN has created an ecosystem of peace which we take for granted. We see problems in the Middle East. We see problems uh, uh, happening within Turkey and Russia and so on and so forth. You know, this in our region, the guns are silent. Now, that's a very big deal, you know, for the most diverse region in our planet. And that, that's not the only thing that ASEAN has delivered. I'm, I'm very happy to hear this is good news when you say that uh, Indonesia wants to change its paradigm and now be more open and so on and so forth. The good news is that the ASEAN economic community has created a very detailed blueprint, point by point, on how you can open up the different sectors so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have reached agreement on those points. Now, the tragedy about ASEAN is that when it comes to implementation, the ASEAN track record implementation is pretty bad. Even, even the ASEAN Secretary said it's about 80%. And if you work with ASEAN, you know that ASEAN moves like a crab. Takes two steps forward, one step backwards, one step sideways. You look at it in short, slow term motion, it seems to be moving now in circles. And then a decade later, you discover ASEAN has moved so far ahead. Why? So that, that's the, you have to understand the dynamics of each region. And for us, you know, the good news for us is that with Indonesia deciding to open up, and I'm not giving any secrets away, and I, and I suspect you may all beat me up for this. Traditionally, Indonesia has been the most reluctant country to open up its economy within the ASEAN family. That's been a tradition. It goes back 30, 40 years. But despite that, but the trend is towards opening up. You know, And I, my message to my Indonesian friends is a very simple thing. In a global era, you have to deal with global competition. Forget the idea you can just succeed regionally. But if Indonesia, the largest economy, cannot compete in the ASEAN economic community, which is a baby pool of competition, relatively speaking, how are you going to compete globally? So the, and therefore, if Indonesia makes a big leap forward, implements the ASEAN economic community provisions, then believe me, the projections for ASEAN growth grow even more uh, uh, better in the next decade. So if, if, if AEC is implemented that goes beyond 80% to 90%, 95%, I guarantee you that ASEAN will grow faster and Indonesia will do better. I hope I got rid of some of the doom and gloom here. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Can I turn to you, yeah. Minister Bajanagoro? Yeah. Do you share uh, the professor's uh, optimistic view of ASEAN and what Indonesia stands to gain? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, uh, what Professor Bambubadi mentioned about the, the reluctant side of Indonesia, I think it really happens I mean, because I'm involved in the financial sector. But it's, simple beca it's simply because we are the biggest market and we always feel that uh, others trying to, you know, <laughs> take advantage of our market. <laughs> But then, you're the most beautiful lady. <laughs> <laughs> but then, 
in my opinion, uh, we believe we have the advantage of being competitive in ASEAN. That's, this is the, sometimes people forget, you know, because we always feel that we are only the market. But if you remember that although, although we are the market, we also have the position to make our industry more efficient, to be even competitive in our market itself, you know, because then our challenge now is how to make our companies, Indonesian companies, uh, competitive enough in our domestic market. And if you are competitive in domestic market, then I believe you will be competitive in ASEAN. And we have some examples. I believe uh, here there are uh, uh, representative from automotive industry. Now our automotive industry that used to be protected in the past, used to get a lot of privilege. Now they have become competitive domestically, and now they have the capacity to do export because what? Because they can competitive with other uh, similar automotive industry in ASEAN. If I can go back to you, uh, Bapak Anin, uh, you've been uh, over the last you know, two, three years investing quite a lot in technology in Indonesia. Uh, what's happening in Indonesia on the digital side? Yeah. I think, look, um, if you look at technology, it's basically uh, trying to get rid of inefficiency. Right? And we have quite a lot of it uh, in Indonesia, and that's, that's normal for growing uh, country, right? Um, <clears throat> tell you a couple of anecdotes that Indonesia actually, you know, are already innovative uh, from, you know, uh, long back, right? If you go to Indonesia, you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, you would imagine that you go there, get buckets of chicken. It's actually the largest uh, music uh, distributor in Indonesia as well, right? So that's how they make money. And the same thing like 7-Eleven, right? If you go to 7-Eleven, uh, wherever, you, know, you come in and go, but over there is a place to hang out and you have more sitting area than retail area, for example. Right? Now, the, um, uh, you know, uh, I would say the source of the uh, innovation is still the same for digital uh, uh, innovation because it just uh, spurred the growth even further. Now, we as a group uh, have a media arm and we touch 170 million people every day, uh, but we think uh, technology will change. And when we talk about technology, we don't only talk about e-commerce, but e-commerce is certainly big. Uh, you know, um, John's company, you know, next year will be 1 billion GMV. The same thing, we have uh, one of the uh, members here, Alfin, another e-commerce play, marketplace, will also get there. So it is not uh, small by any mean, right? But it doesn't stop there because you also have um, another uh, vertical that's also interesting, which is enabling uh, technology. Right? Whether you call it the last mile uh, distribution like Gojek, whether you call it Craved, which is uh, <clears throat> uh, OpenTable.com open in Indonesia, which has already 20,000 restaurants hook up. Or the last thing is the advertising uh, and digital media. Uh, because no matter what, uh, you know, people in Indonesia, they're very well connected.